after and uh, it's uh, my greatest pleasure to introduce the team to maybe I guess reintroduce the team that's uh, in charge of this mini course, the team of Edik and Pasha. And uh, today we have a continuation of the mini course presented by Pasha. So please give him your uh, full and undivided attention. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Uh, and uh, I will continue this uh, uh, mini course. So uh, this is based on our joint work with uh, Edik Frankel and David Kajda. And uh, Edik explained in the previous uh, uh, talk, the general framework of the analytic uh, approach to the Langlands uh, correspondence, to the geometric Langlands correspondence and uh, uh, the notion of uh, uh, Heke operators uh, in that theory. And I'm going to explain uh, how these things behave in some simple examples of genus zero. So we will consider uh, uh, curves with parabolic uh, points. Uh, so, so we will consider moduli spaces of bundles on, uh, on uh, a curve, which is going to be genus zero, namely P1, uh, and we'll have some uh, marked points where we, uh, we'll, uh, our bundles are going to have parabolic structures. And so that's uh, going to be the setup. And actually the, uh, the simplest interesting case is four points. And we will spend some time talking about that case. Okay, so let me uh, just talk about uh, this. Uh, Heke operators uh, for projective line with four points. So, uh, so Langland's theory works uh, with local fields. Uh, uh, and uh, so I will uh, for some time talk about arbitrary local field. But uh, for mathematical physics, uh, mostly we are interested in uh, Archimedean fields, which are real and complex numbers. So uh, a local field has a norm map uh, from the uh, non-zero elements to uh, positive real numbers. Uh, and uh, this map is the following. So for real numbers, it is just what you think, the absolute value. And for complex numbers, it is not what you think. It is square of the absolute value. So it is not a norm in the usual sense in that case, but it has the benefit that uh, uh, when you scale uh, uh, by a, a number lambda, the, um, uh, the big measure scales by uh, uh, absolute value of lambda in this sense, norm of lambda in this sense. Of course, if you scale uh, the big measure on the complex plane, uh, by lambda, then it multiplies by absolute value of lambda squared. So I don't want that square. So therefore I redefine the notion of, of norm and that's uh, convenient for this theory. And uh, for non-Archimedean fields like phiatic fields, so we have uh, uh, a uniformizing element, which in the phiatic case is just the number P and uh, the norm, uh, so, so we have residue field, uh, which is the quotient of the ring of integer by the maximal ideal. It's a finite field of size Q and uh, we will uh, uh, define the norm of the uh, uniformizing element to be Q in. For example, for the field of Piadic numbers, uh, the norm of P will be P inverse. That's the usual convention. And it has uh, also that benefit that when you multiply uh, 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 when you rescale by some scalar lambda, the Lebesgue measure scales by uh, normal. So that's true for all local fields. Okay, so now uh, uh, my curve is going to be P1 and my uh, group is going to be PGL2. Uh, and we are gonna talk about uh, G bundles with uh, parabolic structures at points uh, zero, one, uh, T and infinity where T is going to be a point in F. Actually, there is a more general uh, setting where we have a quadruple of points defined over F. For example, over real numbers, we could take uh, two pairs of complex conjugate points. So that's an interesting special case, but I won't talk about that. So uh, now, uh, so then we can consider the moduli uh, space of uh, stable uh, G bundles on P1. Uh, with parabolic structures at these points and of degree uh, zero. So, 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 uh, so what is a G bundle? G is PGL2. 
So a PGL2 bundle is the same thing as a GL2 bundle, which is a two-dimensional vector bundle, but modular tensoring with line bundles. And therefore it has degree defined mod two. And so we will consider degree zero uh, sta stable bundles. And then one can show that this uh, space, so the, in general bundles form a stack, but stable uh, because the bundles have automorphism groups, but um, um, stable bundles have a trivial automorphism group. And therefore the set of stable bundles can be considered as an algebraic variety. Moreover, it's a smooth variety. And in this case, it is just a line, projective line without the, the, the same four points. And um, so how to uh, attach a bundle to a parabolic bundle to uh, this uh, to a point in this variety? Well, uh, so suppose we are given Y, a point in this uh, variety, then our bundle is going to be the following. So first of all, as an abstract bundle without parabolic structures, it will be just trivial, so O plus O. Uh, and uh, uh, what are parabolic structures? Parabolic structures means that we have to put, um, uh, choose a point in the, uh, uh, so if you have a PGL2 bundle, there is an associated bundle with uh, fiber P1. Um, and, and you can, uh, and parabolic structure at a point means that you pick a point in the fiber of that P1 bundle. In other words, if you th think about two-dimensional vector bundles, you have to pick a line uh, in the two-dimensional fiber. And uh, so uh, I'm going to choose, uh, so, so that means that in this setting, choosing a parabolic structure at the points is just amounts to choosing a number or infinity, which is a point on P1, because all fibers of this P1 bundle are the same here, since our bundle is trivial as an abstract bundle. So I'm going to do in the following way. Uh, at zero, I will fix point zero. At one, I will fix point one. At y, at t, I will fix point y. And at infinity, I'll fix infinity. And then uh, this is stable. So I will explain in a second what that means to be stable. But uh, it, it's stable if and only if y is exactly from our set. So, so now what does it mean to be stable? So the usual definition of stability without parabolic points is the, the following, that we consider like rank two bundles. So we have a notion of degree and we also have, have a notion of slope, uh, which, uh, which is a degree divided by rank. So for rank two bundles, it is one half of the degree. And uh, for uh, line bundles, it is uh, just the degree. And, um, uh, and then uh, stable means that uh, every subbundle, uh, non-trivial subbundle, should have a slope which is less than the slope of the bundle itself. But uh, in the case of parabolic uh, bundles, so more precisely, so this is the extension of this theory due to Sichadri, and uh, uh, there you have to fix some numbers which are called parabolic weights. We will do the simplest thing and fix them to be zero and one half. And in this case, the notion of slope. Uh, is uh, modified as follows. So, uh, so slope uh, in general is uh, half. So it is going to be still half of the degree as before, but plus a quarter of the number of parabolic points. So in this case, we have four, four parabolic points. So it is one half of the degree plus one. And uh, this um, uh, slope of a line bundle uh, line sub bundle would be again the degree as before, and then uh, plus one half of the number of parabolic points contained in this line sub bundle. Because if you have a line sub bundle, it's a family of lines in the fibers, and in particular, if you add a parabolic point, this family may or may not contain the fixed line at that point. And uh, we count those the uh, points where it does contain, and that number is called n, and then the slope is this. And, uh, and then the definition is the same. Uh, stable means that slope of the line bundle is less than the slope of the whole bundle. Line sub bundle, less than the whole bundle. And then the exercise is that it's stable if and only if this is so. So this gives us a, a bijection between uh, this set uh, and uh, P1 without uh, four points. Asha, uh, can we do this exercise? Because I, I think it will help because 
you're saying that it why it doesn't have to be zero one t so which are the positions of the points right so it's kind of an important that, 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 that's right so uh okay so so what is uh, uh so first of all um uh so, uh, so, so if uh, so let's do one direction. So if y is not equal to, to this, then uh, our bundle uh, is uh, stable. So uh, let us look at all possible subbundles. So first of all, we have subbundles of degree zero, which are just correspond to lines in the two-dimensional space. Uh, and uh, such uh, so that uh, okay, such subbundle also trivial subbundle. Uh, uh, how many of these uh, parabolic points uh, can it contain? Well, so uh, so our, in our case, degree of E is uh, zero. So uh, the slope of E is one and slope of L uh, is, uh, well, if L is trivial, then it's also zero plus one half of the number of points. So for stable, uh, it may contain uh, uh, no more, then uh, uh, two, uh, one point. It can. It is not allowed to contain two points. So that's why we have to have y not equal to zero, one, or infinity. Because if it equals to to those, then uh, there will be. Uh, so for example, if y equals to zero, then if we take here the bundle corresponding to taking zero everywhere, that will contain two of the parabolic uh, uh, lines. And that makes it semi-stable, but not stable. And uh, so it remains to explain why we also need the uh, y not equal to t. Uh, and for that purpose, we have to also look at sub-bundles here, uh, which are uh, um, O of minus 1. So O of minus 1, uh, how can we map O of minus 1 to O plus O? Uh, well, this means that we have to, uh, I mean, there is only one way up to isomorphism. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, so this means that we have to fix two sections of, uh, let's say, all of one. And uh, we can fix, so what are sections of all of one? They are uh, functions of, of, of z uh, of degree at most one. So the linear function. Well, we can assume that it's well known that this trivial bundle is an extension of O of one by O minus one. So, but right. And so then you just say that there are at most two points now that you could. No, 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 no. But for, three. for that case, we, 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 need, uh, we need at most three points. Three points, right. Right. Maybe so I can, not allow it to maybe contain maybe I can contribute points. to this discussion by, by kind of universal property, a map from O of minus one to O plus O is a map from P1 to P1, and it's a question of mapping four points to four points under this map. Is that the... That's right. Oh, okay. You can, you okay. can view it that Very way good. too. So, so uh, we can think of two sections of O of one, which is like one and Z, and the ratio of these sections is Z, and uh, and then it should not be equal uh, to, uh, to the corresponding uh, uh, thing here at all four points. So that's exactly why uh, this y should not be equal to t, because if that happens, then it will be mm -hmm. equal to all four points. And if you can check easily the other direction, but if these conditions are satisfied, then uh, this bundle is stable. Perfect. OK. Is, uh, every, I mean, I'm going very slowly now, but I will speed up. So are, are there any questions? No, please don't speed up. This is the right speed. Ah, OK. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, in fact, we can do all these things for any projective curve, smooth projective curve X, uh, uh, and uh, with any set of parabolic points. And uh, we can also consider bundles of degree one, uh, which is in general a different thing. But uh, if uh, you have at least one parabolic point, then uh, the spaces of bundles of degree zero and one um, you know, isomorphic. They can be identified by uh, operation, which is, uh, plays a central role in this whole business and uh, called the Hecke modification at the point P using the parabolic line. So that means uh, that uh, when you start with a bundle of degree zero and you look at uh, this point P, uh, you can define a new bundle uh, uh, which, uh, whose sections 
uh, on an open set would be sections of your original bundle, but they are allowed to have a, a first order pole at P, but residue at this pole must lie in the parabolic line. Uh, and uh, then uh, this bundle itself has a canonical parabolic structure also, and this map defines you in isomorphism. Uh, and the inverse is given by the backwards Hickey multiplication. And also, of course, like I mentioned, uh, our degree is only defined modulo two because we are studying PGL2 bundles. So by tensoring for O of one, you can identify these things. Of course, in an arbitrary curve, you have to pick an O of one, you have to pick a bundle of degree one, but once you've done that, you will have uh, such an identification. Okay, and so, uh, so now uh, what I want uh, to do, so I will, uh, in my talk, I will always have at least one parabolic point, and then uh, I'm going to use that point. Uh, in fact, uh, I will have a point infinity, and I will use the point infinity to make this identification. So, in, uh, uh, so now let me explain what are Hecke modifications, uh, how, how Hecke modifications uh, work. So uh, uh, suppose we have a point X, on our curve, which is different from the parabolic point. Uh, and, uh, and suppose we have a line in the fiber uh, over, over that point, so a point in P1. Uh, and uh, so then, uh, so we remember we have this uh, line uh, parabolic bundle E sub Y, which is attached to uh, uh, a point Y. Uh, so this is the bundle E sub Y. Uh, and uh, we can apply to it KK modification. So this means that at that point, we will change the bundle as follows. So uh, sections of the new bundle will be the sections of the old bundle, but uh, they are allowed to have poles at this point, but residue must be in S. Pole, first order pole at this point, but uh, residue must be in S. And uh, then uh, the KK modification will be a bundle of degree one, but I will uh, identify it uh, as I said here, with bundles of degree zero, so H X S of E sub Y will be some E sub Z. I should mention that the uh, Hecke modification of a stable bundle may be unstable, but uh, generically it will be stable. And so by rationally, at least we can write this uh, as follows, H X uh, uh, S of E Y equals to E Z. And the proposition is that uh, then uh, in, the, in terms of these presentations, the formula for this Hecke modification is the following. So Z equals to S minus one times ST minus XY divided by S minus X, S minus Y. So it's a very nice and simple formula and it's an easy exercise to check uh, this, this formula for. So uh, any questions? And then in general, it's some kind of interesting birational dynamics on this moduli space or some sort of, you know, like a pen liver type of thing. Is that the... Yes, yes, there is some, there are some interesting uh, birational uh, maps that come up from, from this thing. So in general, I have to say that the reason we were able to construct a single map is because uh, our fibers, are, our bundle is trivial as an abstract bundle. So uh, we can, uh, Hecke modification, normally is parameterized by a point on the curve and the point S in the fiber over that point. So we cannot just uh, pick S independently of X, but in this case we can because of that. Uh, and that's actually important for, uh, it, the theory is much simpler because of that. Okay, okay so uh, so now I will uh, define Hecke operator. So uh, as Eddie explained, the uh, Hecke operator is obtained by, uh, so it's an integral transform on functions uh, on this space of bundles, uh, which uh, basically takes a function uh, and uh, integrates uh, it uh, uh, over the space of all Hecke modifications. It's an integral over S of this function transformed by uh, uh, Hecke modification at S. So it's a one dimensional integral. But of course, when I say that it is uh, uh, functions, I am uh, lying because in fact, uh, it acts on uh, half densities. And uh, when I say that it integrates over S, it is also uh, 
uh, a sim oversimplification because I have to say with respect to which measure. So there is a certain canonical measure with respect to which you have to integrate. I think Eddie probably explained uh, in general terms what that measure is. Uh, uh, and so I will explain uh, now what it looks like uh, in very concrete terms. So, uh, so H sub X will be the Heike operator uh, at X. And in fact, I will uh, modify it by this factor, x, norm of x, x minus one, x minus t to the minus one half, that turns out to be convenient. Uh, and um, uh, then I want to write it down as an integral transform. So uh, as I said, it acts on half densities on, uh, on our uh, bond zero, or more precisely, actually it acts, well, so far I was considering algebraic variety band zero, which is just uh, P1 without four points. But uh, uh, now we will consider points of that variety over F, which is an analytic manifold over this local field. So for example, over uh, uh, R, it will be basically R without four points or RP1 without four points. And over C, it will be CP1 without four points. And they'll be integrating over that analytic manifold. So uh, I have this half density dx to the one half on P1. So it has a sim simple pole uh, at infinity, but uh, otherwise smooth. And I will uh, use it to identify uh, uh, half densities with functions. Uh, and uh, so then uh, uh, the space of square integrable half densities on P1 of F uh, will be identified with L2 of F uh, with the Lebesgue measure dx. Uh, and so, uh, so, so the Heike operator in this presentation. I, I'm a little bit confused. So, if F is some general local field, that you don't mean Lebesgue measure, right? You mean something else. And what is, the, in fact, what is half density for general local field? I don't understand. That. No. So, so if you have a, a okay, so. Uh, so if you have, uh, so, so I, I told you that there is a norm map from F star to, uh, to C star, mm -hmm. which is what to, to R plus. And uh, so, uh, so it's a representation of uh, the group F star into R plus. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so if you have a, a line bundle on your algebraic variety, then on your analytic manifold uh, of F points, you will have a bundle uh, with structure group F star, which is the multiplicative group of your field. Mm -hmm. Now, since you have a representation, a homomorphism of that into another group, you can consider the associated bundle. So you have R plus bundle over uh, your analytic menu. Basically, it means that if you have some covering by balls and transition from one to, to another will be multiplication by some positive real number. Okay. And, and so you have the canonical bundle of your manifold. So we can view it over F as a bundle with uh, uh, F times uh, structure group. And then uh, we take the associated bundle and that's called the bundle of densities. So, but, but then you can take square root of that by taking square roots of those positive real numbers. And that would be a bundle of half density. Oh, okay. And uh, so, so this means, uh, in other words, you, should, you have to take so differential forms on your uh, of top degree on your uh, uh, manifold, and those are just functions. But uh, the transition maps uh, are uh, Jacobians, uh, which are valued in F star. So you take absolute value of those Jacobians and raise it to power one half, and that gives you a new object which will be a half density called absolute value of omega to the one half. And so then you can multiply it by functions. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Still not Lebesgue measure, but it's fine. Ooh. What do you, no, there is also Lebesgue measure on F, which you is a- car a, measure a, or something, no, not Lebesgue. Ah, okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Okay, but I said that mostly the story, I mean, for mathematical physics, the story is mostly about real and complex numbers. And in that case, it is a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so then the formula for the Heike operator is the, this. 
So it is integral over your field of uh, uh, your function. So it's an integral transform of functions of one variable, and it acts on a function psi as follows. It, Hx psi acting on y is the integral over f of psi transformed by the Hecke modification, which is the formula we have already seen. And then uh, I told you that you have to put the correct measure, and that happens to be this uh, norm of uh, uh, s minus x times s minus y. So that turns out to be, if you write things in coordinates, that's, that, that turns out to be the measure that you should use. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say that there's a measure you should use because, uh, for example, it depends on y, and that's because this is not a function, but a half density, so part of the of that kind of enters here, but the final formula is going to be like this. I'll explain you a little bit more about that later. And using this formula, we can compute the Schwartz kernel of this operator. So this is still not uh, the, the way we write integral transforms normally, because when we write integral transforms, usually we write that this is the integral of psi of z times dz uh, it, and times some kernel function, k of yz. And uh, this is not in that form. And to make it uh, turn it into that form, we have to make a change of variable declaring this to be z. Uh, however, this, uh, so we have to write it like this. But now note that this is a two to one map. Uh, it's a quadratic map from P1 to P1 of degree two. And so that when you make, so it's a double cover. And to, when you make this uh, change of variable, uh, uh, you will, uh, first of all, you will get a factor of two. And also, it will not be integration over the whole P1 of f, but only over the image of this map. So if f is complex numbers, then it uh, will be over the whole P1 of f. But, uh, but if uh, f is real numbers, for example, it will only be over the image of this quadratic function, which is not the whole thing. Uh, and uh, this is the result. It's, uh, it can also be found in the paper of Kantsevich from 2007. So uh, there is this remarkable polynomial uh, of four variables. Uh, which is the which is this uh, x y plus x z plus y z minus t squared plus four one plus t minus x minus y minus z x y z uh, and uh, then uh, the operator uh, h written as an ordinary integral transform has the following form so it, I promised you the factor of two here and uh, then uh, there is a, a dz divided by the square root of the norm of this polynomial. And then there is this uh, theta uh, here. And theta is uh, really the indicator. It is one. Theta of a is one if uh, a is a square, and theta of a is zero if not. So we only integrate. So this theta is put here to make sure that we only integrate over squares. In other words, you could write it as a, just integral over squares for real numbers over, not over squares, but over points where this polynomial is positive for real. And times psi of z. So the kernel uh, is, is this thing. I don't understand, this, this depends on t or it doesn't depend on t? Depends on t, this polynomial depends on t. So t occurs here. And Where's the... Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. And t is the same t as before. Right, it is the fourth point. So there's a cross ratio of the four points. Okay. So if the three points are zero, one, and infinity, there's the fourth point. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, uh, so this is the uh, operator considered by Kansevich. Uh, and uh, now uh, this is well-defined. Um, if psi is a, let's say, uh, you know, smooth function uh, with support away from zero, one, infinity, and t. Uh, because uh, when you integrate uh, against such a function, uh, what happens is, well, you have some singularities. Uh, th this polynomial is sometimes zero. But uh, uh, so if y is away from those parabolic points, it turns out that uh, this polynomial is a polynomial of z. It's a quadratic polynomial. And it turns out that uh, for generic y, when y is not one of those four points, this polynomial has distinct roots. So we have an integral of the form 
uh, integral locally we have an integral of the form integral of dx divided by square root of x times x plus epsilon and uh, this is convergent but when uh, y becomes uh, uh, one of those four points uh, the roots uh, two roots collide and uh, then uh, you get uh, this expression uh, where epsilon goes to zero and it's easy to check that uh, uh, this is a calculus exercise, very easy. You just make a change of variable uh, to see that this integral uh, behaves like log of one over epsilon. And uh, so this means that uh, uh, the integral converges, but uh, if you start with a smooth function, you will not uh, get a smooth function, but you will get a function with logarithmic singularities at the four points. It will be smooth outside, but uh, with logarithmic singularities at those points. And by the way, over periodic field, these are complex valued functions. So over periodic field smooth means locally constant. So any questions up to this point? No questions? Is the speed okay or too slow? Is there any, is there any way to see where this polynomial F comes from? Uh, well, it comes out of calculation, uh, but uh, it has many remarkable properties and there is some algebra geometric meaning, but I, I, I will not be able to say now. I, I, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't understand very well how to best talk about this. Yeah, other questions? So over the attic fields, you know, you got uh, smooth you know, you go again, you get again smooth uh, function after you apply this integral or? You get a smooth function outside of those four points, but at those four points, you will have logarithmic singularity. So they will, the function will look like log of absolute value of X when X goes to zero, for instance. L uh, not of X, but of Y. Log of absolute value of Y. So they're not locally constant functions? Uh, how you see not, the log? Not near Y log. equals zero. This is not locally constant near Y equals zero. So, so norm of y, so over periodic field, norm of y uh, take values p to the n. And, and uh, when, uh, so your sequence goes to zero, then uh, this n grows. And so log of norm y will be log of p to the n, which is basically n. So this function is not locally constant near zero, but it is locally constant near uh, other points. Does it make sense, Lyosha? Yes, yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so uh, this was considered by Kansevich and uh, the theorem which can be found in his paper uh, and uh, not very hard uh, to prove is that uh, this operator is compact. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a symmetric operator uh, uh, but but it's actually compact uh, and self-adjoint. Uh, and uh, moreover, operators corresponding to different points commute. So uh, I will explain the proof, but uh, for example, uh, to make it more concrete, in the case of complex numbers, this operator uh, looks like this. So two over phi times the integral over C of psi of Z dz dz, dz bar divided by the absolute value of this polynomial. And this absolute value is the usual. Uh, and so let me explain the proof that it is compact. So basically self-adjoint uh, and everything else is, is easy. In particular, this commutativity is easy because when you do Hecke modifications at two different points, you do it independently. And so it doesn't matter in what order you do. It. So, uh, but compactness requires proof. And uh, uh, so, well, it is symmetric because the kernel is symmetric, but uh, uh, compactness is shown as false. So you can show that if you take the square of this, so you have to show that it is bounded first, which can be done. And then you have to show that this operator is Hilbert Schmidt. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and to show that it's Hilbert Schmidt, you have to show that it's kernel uh, is in L2, so it satisfies this, this condition. And this requires a computation because you can compute this kernel and, uh, and you get that it is uh, uh, Hilbert-Schmidt. 
And therefore, it is compact. And then uh, HX is also compact, because if you have a, a self-adjoint bounded operator whose square is compact, then the operator itself is also compact. Because eigenvalues of HX are uh, going to be just square roots, plus minus square roots of eigenvalues of HX squared. Can I ask a random question? Yeah. Sure. Usually for this sort of integral operators, people like to raise absolute values to some, you know, generally speaking, complex powers. If I try this, would that be a reasonable operator? Would that still commute or is it? Uh, so, a... so uh, yeah, I mean, there is, there is a version of that. So at the parabolic points, mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, it won't be just literally that raised to this power, but it will be some, something in that spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take uh, twists, uh, so, so when you do parabolic bundles, you can always uh, uh, do a twist at each parabolic point uh, by, uh, by an element of H2 of your flag variety. So for group G2, it, it will be just uh, by one number. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this means that, uh, okay, so, so this means that instead of parabolic bundles, you will consider uh, bundles which are trivialized at those points. So in, instead of fixing just a line in the fiber, we're going to fix a whole frame. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what GLN bundle means to fix a basis of the fiber. And so this is a bigger space. And then uh, you can consider, uh, so uh, on this space, you have an action of uh, Borel subgroups, product of Borel subgroups of your group, uh, overall parabolic points. So in our case, it's going to be upper triangular matrices. Uh, and then uh, in uh, functions on uh, parabolic bundles uh, are invariant functions with respect to these groups. But you can consider equivariant functions with respect to these groups with, uh, with some characters of these groups. And character could be absolute value of the diagonal element to the power S, for example. And so if you do that, you will get uh, actually four, uh, uh, let's say, real parameters. Uh, or complex parameters into this theory. Uh, and then you will get more complicated kernels, which will be uh, uh, in the spirit that you say. Yeah, but then, then is, that, is, that, is there to our advantage? Because if our, you know, if I have a complex power, I can, if it's, if it's negative, then, well, I mean, if it's, if it's positive, then it's, everything's fine and everything is analytic in this variable. And then we pick up uh, what we want as a, some sort of value of a, of a function at a point. Yeah, so this is this is actually interesting to do. So uh, uh, there will be a zone in which, uh, so I think, uh, so if these parameters are in a certain uh, in a certain uh, uh, range, uh, then uh, this uh, operator will be uh, compact and uh, uh, it will act on L two and everything will be nice. But then when you go outside of that range. It will uh, develop singular singularities, and then you will get some poles. And uh, so, in particular, it's interesting to consider uh, values of this parameter which are negative integers. So there, you will not have a Hilbert space structure, and things will be uh, kind of uh, worse from the point of view of analysis. But this will correspond to uh, uh, beta ansatz. Uh, Sounds great to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the sense that you will be able to consider a finite dimensional version of this theory. Yeah. And that would be the theory of beta and that. Cool. Yeah, so. Uh, so I, I should say that uh, this is a little bit more complicated than you would expect. So we would like to show that this H hat X itself is Hilbert Schmidt. But unfortunately, it's not true. It's almost true in the sense that the integral uh, for uh, the kernel uh, of HX itself squared is divergent, but it's logarithmically divergent. So, uh, so this operator is not Hilbert Schmidt, but if you, uh, so in fact, uh, so because hx square, trace of hx square is infinite, but it's only logarithmically divergent. So if you take hx square to the power one plus epsilon, uh, where uh, epsilon is any positive numbers, then that trace is converged. But of course, it's uh, not easy to compute this power. So uh, the easiest powers to compute are integer powers. And that's why uh, 
we uh, just show that the trace of hx to the fourth is finite, which is what we did there. Anyway, uh, I also want to say that there is an action, uh, important symmetry of this space, which is action of the group Z2 cross Z2. So there is S0, which is, uh, sends Y to T over Y, and S1, which sends uh, Y to Y minus one uh, over one mi Y minus T. They're both involutions uh, and they commute. So they give uh, indeed an action of this Klein four group. And this group simply, um, kind of act simply transitively on the parabolic points. Uh, on, on the, on this, so in this case, the curve coincides with this moduli space and the points also the same. And then this group acts on the parabolic points. Uh, so these are uh, just Hecke modifications at the parabolic points along the parabolic line fixed at that point. And then uh, you can use these to describe the asymptotics of your KK operator when the point X goes to one of the parabolic points. So recall that uh, our KK operator was defined when our point X was different from zero, one T and infinity. And so, uh, but, but when it goes to one of those points, uh, KK operator has a singularity but you can describe the behavior. So the asymptotics is very simple. So the leading uh, coefficient of asymptotics is just uh, a scalar. So, so uh, hx behaves like norm of x to minus one times log of norm of x uh, uh, times the identity of uh, And uh, there are similar asymptotics at the points uh, zero, one, and t. So at the point zero, it acts like a, uh, uh, multiple, uh, so the asymptotics is some log times S0. Uh, at one, it is a log times S1. And at uh, T, it is log times S0, S1, which is the same as ST. Yeah. So, uh, and what this shows is that, in fact, uh, this convergence, so this means that if I divide HX uh, by norm X inverse times log of norm X, uh, this will converge to the identity. But that convergence is weak, not strong, because uh, a sequence of compact operators cannot strongly converge to an identity, because compact operators are closed under uh, the operator topology. So this means that uh, uh, as a, in operator topology, HX does not go to one, but if you apply it to any vector, then uh, HX divided by this function does not go to one, but if you apply it to any vector, any function, then it does. So any questions up to this point? Okay, so now we'll, let me talk about the spectral decomposition. Uh, so spectral decomposition, uh, so we have a spectral theorem for compact self-adjoint operators. Uh, and it says that such an operator has discrete spectrum and eigenvalues going to zero. Uh, and the, here we have, and the same theorem holds for commuting compact operators. Uh, so uh, we have these commuting compact operators HX. So they have some common eigenbasis Psi N uh, and uh, we can normalize. Uh, uh, so, so actually it turns out that eigenvalues are distinct. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, again, basis is well defined up to phase factors. And we uh, can fix, uh, so uh, we can fix eigen basis to be orthonormal, then uh, well defined up to phase factors. And uh, further, uh, because our kernels are real, uh, we can also choose uh, these eigenvectors to be real. Uh, and uh, also positive near the point infinity. And that will uh, determine the phase factor. So that's a unique way to uh, determine a basis of our Hilbert space. And uh, uh, so these functions are smooth uh, outside of the uh, points zero, one, T and infinity, but at those points have logarithmic singularities. And the beautiful thing about this special case of uh, four points is that uh, because uh, the curve in this case coincides with the moduli space, um, the eigenvalues coincide with eigenvectors. 
So the eigenvalue function beta n of x is actually the same as the eigenvector up to some constants here. And then we, you can write the formula for the reproducing kernel, which is two times theta of this polynomial divided by the square root of this polynomial. So basically it is like two over this polynomial times the indicator function of when this is a square. It can be written as the sum of cn, sin of x, sin of y, psi n of z. So this, this is a kind of a feature of this polynomial that's important that, well, because this operator is symmetric, the polynomial is in symmetric in y and z, but it actually also symmetric in x and y. So it's actually symmetric under the group S3 of permutations of all three variables. And this is a special feature of uh, um, this uh, situation with four points. Although uh, in the recent work of uh, Kansevich, uh, Gayota and Witten, uh, it has been uh, explained that uh, this is not such a special feature, actually. If you uh, generalize Heike operators to something that is called addition kernels. And uh, so that's a com completely new uh, theory, very interesting. And there were many talks about this uh, uh, recently. Uh, okay, and the corollary of this is that if you multiply the, the uh, Heke oper two Heke operators, it actually expresses as a linear combination, as a continuous linear combination of uh, Heke operators. So Hx times Hx Hy is equal to the integral of the same function times Hz dz. And uh, to show this, it is uh, very easy. You just apply it to eigenvectors and you uh, see that uh, it is, uh, they act by the same thing. So, uh, so it, actually the fact that the kernel is symmetric in all three variables immediately gives us this structure. Basically, this means that we have a commutative algebra with, uh, so to speak, basis Hx, and it acts on our Hilbert space, and the space uh, decomposes in one-dimensional representations of this algebra. And in particular, this means that this constant Cn, which I wrote here and here, uh, are actually uh, um, can be determined also from those eigenfunctions, uh, namely by uh, by saying that uh, so if they're normalized uh, to be uh, of unit uh, length uh, of unit norm, then this is uh, we can compute such constant which is uh, asymptotics. So I said it has logarithmic uh, singularity at infinity. So this means that we have uh, and they have to be positive at infinity. So this means that this ratio is going to have a finite limit, which is a certain positive number. And it turns out that this CN is just the reciprocal of that positive number. So the final formula is that the reproducing kernel formula for this uh, uh, function is that it is the sum of psi n of x, psi n of y, psi n of z divided by psi n infinity. So that's the spectral decomposition of this term. So any questions? Is there a way to label the uh, psi n with natural numbers? Is there a like natural way you know, to order this uh, eigenvalues or? Yeah, you, you can you can just order them by size. Uh, so, well, uh, more precisely, uh, our operator is uh, is not positive and definite, so there are positive and negative eigenvalues, and. Uh, but, but you can take uh, something like square of the separator and then label by size, something like that. Not, not, a, particularly, uh, not a particularly good uh, numbering. Uh, actually, what will happen is uh, over the complex field, for example, uh, uh, the set of eigen, so large eigenvalues will arrange themselves into something like a two dimensional lattice. Uh, and uh, so, so they're more naturally labeled by pairs of integers. So that, that has some geometric meaning. Alyosha, does it answer your question? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, and so, uh, okay, so these numbers uh, is a sequence. It, it, so it's an L2 sequence, but it's almost an L1 sequence. Uh, should be almost an L1 sequence. So if you take uh, power two plus epsilon uh, for any positive epsilon, this uh, should be converging. I have not uh, checked that, but I'm pretty sure it's true. 
And so the proposition is that the uh, uh, spectrum of these operators is simple and they don't have a common kernel. Uh, so, so, well, which of course is a part of the statement that spectrum is simple. They don't have a, well, I mean, even one dimensional kernel. They don't have a common kernel because when X goes to infinity, this operator uh, divided by some function tends to the identity. And they all commute. And so this recovers the package of properties which Kansevich formulated in his paper. Uh, uh, so, and provides, uh, so, so, but we can generalize it to more points, which I will talk about later. But now I will start talking about the case of Archimedean fields, complex and real. Before this, uh, uh, any questions? So, Andrea, is my speed okay or too, too slow? It is great. I think the speed is just right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, so let me talk about the complex and real case, and this will have to do with some uh, familiar things about differential equations. So we have, uh, so uh, Eddie explained that uh, these Hecke operators are interesting because uh, they commute with the uh, kitchen uh, quantum system and also satisfy something which is called the universal Oper equation. And I will explain how that plays out in this example. So uh, consider this differential operator, d sub x, x, x minus one, x minus t, d sub x plus x. It's a symmetric operator, and it is actually equivalent to Lamé operator. So uh, the, more, more precisely, it's related to uh, by something that's called half and transform. It doesn't matter right now what it is. Uh, you can write it in, uh, uh, so uh, you can think about elliptic curve, uh, which is, uh, uh, covers uh, uh, P1 uh, by a double cover uh, branched at the point 0, 1, t, and infinity. Um, and you can lift that equation to that curve. And on that equation, uh, uh, lift this operator to that curve. And uh, on that curve, uh, uh, this operator will look like uh, uh, this uh, uh, second derivative plus one quarter of the P function. So this is the Lamé operator with uh, 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 coupling constant minus one half. It's a unipotent case. It's a case when monodromy uh, matrices, uh, the monodromy matrix at the origin is uh, unipotent. Uh, and uh, the important uh, theorem is that uh, uh, this differential operator commutes with the integral operator uh, which uh, with, with the Hecke operator. And uh, this follows, so in fact, this is an analytic statement, so it requires some care, and I will uh, later say more about it. But uh, the most uh, elementary uh, way to say it is that uh, in, in this kernel one over the square root of ft of x, y, z satisfies a, a partial differential equation which means that if we apply the operator L with respect to Y to this kernel, it is the same as apply L with respect to Z to this kernel. So this is something that you can check using a, a computer algebra system. Uh, by hand, it is a little bit tedious, uh, but it's true. And uh, this really implies that this operator commutes with uh, this differential operator. And uh, again, if you make a kind of slightly stronger version of this statement, which is a in more analytic flavor in the sense, so this should be satisfied in the sense of distributions. Then you will uh, derive that uh, eigenfunctions of those Hecke operators uh, are uh, eigenfunctions also of the Lamé operator. So they actually Lamé functions in the Archimedean case. So more precisely for the real numbers, there are some Lamé functions and for uh, complex numbers, uh, they will satisfy also the complex conjugate equation. L bar psi n equals to lambda n uh, psi n. Uh, so, uh, and so let us uh, look at the complex case first. Uh, so what happens is, uh, so in this case, these uh, uh, eigenfunctions psi n of x 
because they satisfy uh, these two uh, complex conjugate Lame equation, uh, they are uh, going to, uh, we should be able to write them in this way. Uh, so this is also a real function. So it's going to be some, uh, uh, again, so, so we have these solutions F1n and F2n, which are holomorphic solution of this Lame equation, but they are not single valued. But if you form this combination, F1 times F2 bar plus F2 times F1 bar, this Hermitian combination, it should be single valued and it should be our eigenfunction psi n of this. So, so this means uh, uh, that, uh, so because the question is what are these numbers lambda n? I mean, you can write down Lame equation for any complex parameter lambda, this is called accessory parameter. Uh, but uh, here we only have a discrete set of those lambda n's. And the question is, which lambda n's do we get? And uh, uh, so uh, the condition we get is that this function should be single valued. And therefore uh, it means that uh, uh, on the monodromy representation of our uh, equation, uh, there is a, a non-degenerate invariant Hermitian form. That's not true for arbitrary lambda n. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, also it, we can see that this Hermitian form cannot be definite. It, it's a Hermitian form on a two dimensional space and it has to be of signature one one because we have a monodromy matrix uh, at the parabolic point, which is unipotent. And this uh, uh, unipotent matrix cannot preserve a definite Hermitian form. Uh, so it's a unipotent, but not the identity matrix. And therefore this form has to be indefinite. And this means that our monodromy representation takes values in SU11, which is SL2R. So, so this means that the condition on this accessory parameter lambda that we get is that the monodromy of uh, uh, the equation takes values in SL2R. And that turns, turns out, so this, uh, uh, this selects a discrete set of lambdas. And conversely, if lambda is such, then you uh, can uh, form this uh, linear combination, this combination here, and it will be, uh, uh, it will be an eigenfunction of the Lamé operator line in L2, and therefore it will also be an eigenfunction. Uh, so, the, so, the, so it will also be an eigenfunction of the, of the KK so, so in fact, it's an if and only if statement. And uh, this means uh, that eigenfunctions of KK operators corresponds to complex numbers uh, such that the monodromy representation lands in SL2. How do we know it lies in L2? I missed that part. Ah, yeah, well, I mean, these uh, functions are logarithmic. Uh, they have logarithmic oh, okay. singularities. So they are, you know, very close to, uh, to bounded. But, uh, but actually in a larger number of points and uh, especially higher genus, it, uh, it's not obvious why these functions are in L2 and uh, this is actually an open problem. So, uh, so the proposition here then is that the eigenfunction of this family of operators correspond to these complex numbers where monodromy is in SL2R and um, uh, uh, let me say something about the positive eigenfunction. So, so there is a, uh, our Hecke operator uh, has a kernel, which is a positive function because it is basically norm of something. And so this is like an infinite matrix with positive elements. And uh, for such matrices, there is a theorem of Perron Frobenius which says that there is an eigenvector, unique eigenvector with uh, also positive entries, which uh, corresponds to the largest uh, eigenvalue, largest positive eigenvalue. And uh, in particular, we are going to have here the same thing. So, uh, so Crane and Rutman uh, generalized this theorem to the setting of functional analysis, and uh, we're going to have exactly that situation. So we have a positive eigenfunction for the largest eigenvalue, uh, and uh, this uh, corresponds to uh, analytic uniformization of uh, CP1 without uh, these points. It, it is known uh, that uh, 
uh, from uh, work of many people, uh, uh, including uh, uh, Faltings and uh, Goldman uh, and others, that uh, 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 second order differential equations uh, like, uh, like this uh, are uh, with monodromy and SL2R uh, are related to uh, real projective structures on, uh, on Riemann surfaces, in our case, on P1 without four points. And uh, the most well, remarkable- like was known like Picard, you know? <laughs> right, but uh, it's, uh, uh, more recently it was studied. Uh, so, so Picard and other classics, they studied uh, analytic uniformization, this particular example, but there are actually, that corresponds to the one of those lambdas, which corresponds to the positive eigenfunction. But there are also others. Actually, it wasn't uh, known for many years that they exist. But then uh, people realized that they exist, and there are infinitely many of them. And that was not known to Picard, I think. And, and, and they, uh, they correspond to the other eigenvalues. And they are related to the one corresponding to uh, analytic uniformization by something that is called grafting. So that procedure uh, was introduced by Goldman. And that was in the 80s. But analytic uniformization story, uh, of course, is, is true that uh, this, is, uh, this was known to uh, 19th century mathematicians and maybe early 20th century. Uh, and uh, so, uh, So they were discussed, uh, the other projective structures were discussed by Goldman and Falkin. So let me explain the story of analytic uniformization, which I, uh, uh, I learned this presentation from uh, uh, the paper of Leon Taktaljan, expository, mostly expository paper. Uh, uh, and so, so the story goes as follows. So, uh, so what is analytic uniformization? Uh, so we have a P1 without four points. So it's a Riemann surface, a hyperbolic Riemann surface. So it has a, uh, it's a quotient of uh, upper half plane by some uh, Fuchsian group. Uh, and in particular, uh, so this covering map has an inverse, which is a multi-valued analytic function. Uh, so if you call it the J, then we call it J inverse from CP1 to C plus. It's a multi-valued function, uh, holomorphic. And then you can consider two other multi-valued holomorphic functions. One is uh, one divided by the square root of the derivative of this thing. And the other is uh, i times this function divided by the square root of its derivative. And then it turns out that those two functions are a basis of solutions of some Lame equation. Uh, and uh, more precisely with the accessory parameter which corresponds to this uh, uh, analytic uniformization. And then you can uh, form this uh, Hermitian combination that I talked about. So that's equal to twice imaginary part of our function divided by the absolute value of its derivative. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so this is a, 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 this function beta is a real uh, analytic function, positive. Uh, so it's clear that it's positive because J inverse takes values in C plus. Uh, and, uh, and it uh, satisfies this pair of equations. And, uh, and then uh, you can look at the metric beta to the minus two times dz squared. And uh, this metric has curvature minus one. So this is a Poincare metric. Uh, and so this is the this eigenvalue of uh, Lamé operator, which corresponds to the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue of K operator. Okay, so this is the story was analytic uniformization. And then uh, I also want to say that uh, uh, it's important, I already mentioned that this equation holds in some uh, kind of analytic sense, not just formally, so in the sense of distribution. So if you look at the distribution one over FT of X, Y, Z, then it should satisfy this differential equation. And for complex case, uh, it should, uh, so this is for complex case, it should satisfy two complex conjugate equations. And for real case, it should satisfy this uh, single equation. So any, any questions?
So uh, I have a question about carry case. In the carry case, you know, you have much fewer tools. You don't have like part integration by parts. So and a lot of stuff works still. You know, if you so there is no differential operators, but hey, right, operators no. still exist, and a lot of stuff works. In fact, I will say a few things about that case later. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, so actually, uh, what uh, it's an interesting computation that you can do here. Uh, well, I said before that the uh, Hickey operator behaves like uh, x to minus to, to the minus one times log x when x goes to infinity times the identity. So the question is, uh, what if we uh, multiply it by absolute value of x, then it will behave like log and subtract the log. So usually if, when you write a symptotic expansion, the next thing after log is a constant. And the question is, is it going to have a limit like this, which I call m? And in fact, yes, uh, there is a, such a limit. It's an unbounded operator. And um, it actually looks simpler than the Hickey operator. So it can also be used, this operator can be used to define the spectral decomposition, but it's a simpler operator. It is in some sense H infinity, except that H infinity doesn't exist and you have to regularize that limit. But when you do, you obtain some nice operator also with simple spectrum, uh, uh, but it's not, it's unbounded, but it's not uh, very unbounded. It's eigenvalues grow logarithmically as opposed to uh, as a power for differential operators. So it more or less behaves like log of uh, log of absolute value of the Lamette. And uh, its kernel is the following. So it is uh, two divided by the norm of y minus z, which has to be regularized uh, in an appropriate way, uh, minus the delta function of y minus z times the log of y, y minus one, y minus t. So in other words, it's an integral transform uh, with just this very simple kernel, one over absolute value of y minus z, uh, plus a operator of multiplication by a function. And this operator is closely related to the integral operator, uh, which was considered by Simon Rusinars in his paper, uh, when he wanted to define self-adjoint extension of uh, 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 Lamea. Uh, uh, so the problem with Lamé operators is they have singularities. And uh, so the usual sturm liouville theory, theory does not uh, immediately give you a self-adjoint extension. And so one way to do that, and that also works in higher rank for stellar moser systems, is to write down some compact integral operator uh, that uh, uh, will commute uh, with this differential. Now, this operator is not compact and not even bounded, but that's... Um, uh, so uh, there is some modification of it, which, uh, which is uh, bounded and compact. And this is what the uh, Rosinars can see. So in that modification, what happens is that uh, these Y and Z uh, live uh, in two different intervals uh, of a circle. And uh, that's why they never, uh, Y minus Z never is zero. And, and that makes it, uh, so that singularity on the diagonal causes it to, be badly behaved, but that doesn't happen in the setting uh, that Rosinars considers. So, uh, any questions? All right. So now I want to talk about Schwartz space. So this Schwartz space is a kind of uh, important uh, thing uh, for this whole business. So. Uh, uh, I, I think the true understanding of analytic. Uh, uh, Langlands uh, is uh, when you uh, uh, when you have there are three definitions of the Schwartz space. Uh, three there should be three definitions of the Schwartz space, and if you have all three, this is a good thing. And in this case, we do have all three. So the first definition is just the space of elements which have rapidly decaying uh, Fourier coefficients with respect to this basis. Uh, so. Uh, so it's a space of functions, like in usual analysis, uh, smooth functions on the circle, for example, are uh, functions whose uh, Fourier coefficients decay faster than any polynomial. And uh, the same definition can be made here. So that gives you some space of functions. And then the question is, this is a spectral description. 
So it doesn't really tell you anything about how these functions behave. And uh, so uh, this behavior can be understood if you look at other definitions. So here is a proposition uh, giving the second description, which uh, I call a geometric description. And this really tells you what these functions look like. So it's the space of functions smooth outside of those points. And uh, near these points, uh, having logarithmic singularity. So this means that near this point, it should have the form A of X plus B of X times log of uh, norm X uh, and a similar form at uh, near infinity and a similar form at uh, other three points where uh, these coefficients A and B are smooth. And so, so this gives us a very- uh, uh, Smooth or doesn't, what does it mean smooth? C infinity. Well, for periodic case, it means locally constant. But for complex and real case, it means C infinity. But usually in the Schwarz space, you also, you know, you, there's some bounds on how the derivatives grow, right? Right, but this is compact. So basically we have a P1. The fact that we have these points is, uh, you should forget about that because you can put them back and uh, it's a kind of uh, compact modular space of semi-stable bundles. And uh, we should think about this as a, a, a operator on a compact manifold. And in this case, uh, Schwartz space is just C infinity space. Because we have discrete spectrum. So it looks like uh, something like Laplace on a compact manifold. So, uh, yeah, so that, uh, I mean, uh, you, you, you get this uh, definition of uh, uh, so all right so so here it's uh, I mean if uh, the problem so for example the, this Lame operator the problem with this operator it's not elliptic at the four singular points if uh, if uh, we didn't have those points uh, then it would be just an elliptic operator and uh, then uh, it's uh, uh, it has discrete spectrum and functions which have uh, rapidly decaying uh, Fourier coefficients with respect to the basis of eigenfunctions are just smooth functions on. So there is this theorem. If you have an elliptic operator on a compact manifold, then it, it has discrete spectrum and uh, f functions which are, uh, uh, which have uh, rapidly decaying Fourier coefficients with respect to the eigenbasis are just smooth functions. It's an if and only if. Does it answer your question? Uh, you are muted. Then. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'm nodding my head. You are not what? Ah, okay. All right. So, uh, and there is a third definition, which, uh, which is the de definition uh, in terms of differential operators. Um, so actually the first two definitions work over any local field. And the third definition works over non-Archimedean, uh, Archimedean fields, real or complex numbers. Uh, and so for example, for complex numbers, uh, it is the space of all uh, functions in L2, such that after application of any monomial in N and L bar, they remain in L2. So this is uh, how you can, you can define this way uh, C infinity functions on the circle or any compact manifold. It is the space of all L2 functions such that if you apply to them uh, derivative uh, as many times uh, as you like as in the sense of distribution, it will remain uh, an L2 function. So if you have a function satisfying this condition, then it lies in C infinity. And that's a theorem from classical analysis. And so here it's exactly going to be like that. So basically it's the same story, except that those parabolic points, you have some logarithmic singularity. But in higher dimensions, of course, the story will look much more complicated. And we do not know a, a good definition of, we do not know the second geometric definition. And uh, this is, a, if we knew it, it would be extremely useful for this whole bit. And uh, another proposition is that this L uh, operator is essentially normal on, uh, on our uh, 
Schwartz space. So this means that uh, if you take L plus L bar, which is symmetric, or one over I L minus L bar, which is also symmetric, uh, then these are uh, essentially self-adjoint on uh, this uh, uh, Schwartz space. So that, that means that their closures are self-adjoint uh, in the sense of von Neumann. And uh, they also strongly commute, which means that they have a spectral decomposition and they, this is a common decomposition. So the spectral projections, which are bounded operators commute with each other. So any, any questions about this? Okay, so let me explain what happens in the non-Archimedean case and probably this will be uh, uh, the end for today. Uh, so uh, the interesting fact that was uh, uh, so the interesting fact which was uh, 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 stated by Kantsevich in his paper and uh, without proof, but but I, I checked that it is correct, and uh, of course he knows the, knew the proof too. So so that uh, eigenvalues of Hecke operators. Uh, over periodic field are algebraic numbers. So this is uh, surprising because, uh, well, so Andre asked uh, what happens if you take this polynomial and raise it to power S or consider some uh, kind of integral operator whose uh, kernel is some absolute value of some polynomial to power S. Well, even, even if you take the simplest possible polynomial such as say X square minus Y square and you raise it to power S, Norm of, to, of x square minus y square to power s, and take uh, view it as a kernel uh, of an integral operator on periodic integers. The eigenvalues of this are not algebraic numbers; they are uh, zeros of some Q-Bessel functions, and uh, which are not expected to be algebraic numbers. But in this case, they are algebraic numbers. So that's a that's a property of integrable systems. So Kantsevich says that there there is a no there should be a notion of a periodic integrable system. So in particular, uh, there should be a periodic Hitchin system, which is basically those Hecke operators. And whenever you have such a system, uh, you expect uh, the corresponding operators to have integer, uh, to have algebraic eigenvalues being algebraic numbers. And uh, let me explain why this is so. So it's actually quite simple. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, we can think of these Hecke operators as a, uh, uh, operators on some uh, so there is some uh, there are some finite dimensional subspaces whose union is dense and invariant under those operators. So uh, so let's take a point x zero, which is not zero one t and infinity, and then uh, for uh, for any uh, n you can uh, average the Hecke operator over the ball around x zero of some uh, radius q to the n. So it's an average over the ball. And uh, the claim is that this is a finite rank operator. So if you, I average the Hecke operator over a small ball, even a very small ball, this will be a finite rank operator. Although the rank is going to grow as the ball gets smaller and smaller because the operator HX itself is not of finite rank. And uh, moreover, if I take uh, uh, the indicator function of, the, of that ball, and uh, generate uh, a, a module over this algebra. So I act on it with all possible agents uh, and span the space with it. It's a finite dimensional vector space, which is invariant under the Hecke operator. And so, uh, so therefore these uh, eigenvalues of HX uh, are eigenvalues uh, uh, of finite matrices of rational numbers. And so they are algebraic numbers. So any questions about this? So here is an example. Uh, I don't understand. So this is the first claim. Why did, how did we use it? Is that used in the proof of the second claim? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if we take the indicator function and act by the operators HX. These claims are related to each other. So they're basically equivalent to each other. Because oh, okay. of this fact that, uh, that our kernel is symmetric in all three variables. Oh, okay. 
the, but you're right that I, it's enough just to know the second claim to see that eigenvalues are algebraic now. And so here is an example. So consider space generated uh, by uh, 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 hx, uh, under hx by this uh, function uh, around some point, uh, uh, let, let's say uh, integer point of radius q inverse. Uh, and uh, let's say this point, it's re residue modular uh, uh, maximal ideal is uh, not equal to zero, one or t. Then uh, the claim is that, uh, so the dimension of this uh, space is uh, Q plus five. So uh, more precisely, it looks like uh, uh, functions on projective line over finite field, which has Q plus one elements. So it's a Q plus one dimensional space plus V prime. And this V prime corresponds to the logarithmic tails at the four points. So this is a four dimensional space, which is spanned by some functions psi zero, psi one, psi t, and psi infinity, which are logarithmic uh, tails. So they look like this. The indicator function of this ball times the log uh, with base Q of the norm of Y inverse. And uh, so this space is invariant and uh, eigenvalues uh, look as follows. So, uh, so there are two eigenvalues which are depend on nothing at all. And they just depend only on Q. And this, they look like this, so it's a strange formula. It's a root of some polynomial, lambda squared minus one plus Q inverse lambda plus eight Q inverse equals zero. And this eight is just twice the number of points, basically. Uh, and uh, so the largest eigenvalue is this lambda plus, which is uh, this expression for the plus sign. And then the other eigenvalues are much smaller than of the order. So this is of the order of one. Uh, and then the other eigenvalues of the order of uh, Q to the minus one half. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so there is zero with multiplicity three. And then the other eigenvalues are, there are Q eigenvalues and they are exactly eigenvalues of the Drinfeld uh, Heke operator over finite field. So Drinfeld uh, studied uh, this operator on uh, uh, automorphic forms, uh, parabolic forms. So it's a, in the simplest case, it's a matrix Q by Q and some commuting matrices Q by Q. And, uh, and Rinfeld proved that the eigenvalues of those matrices are at most uh, two Q to the minus one half. That's a very difficult theorem actually, uh, which uses uh, basically, uh, uh, it's like Ramanujan bar. So it's a no rather deep number theoretic statement. Well, maybe uh, I'm not sure about this particular case, but for arbitrary curve of higher genus, uh, this is a very deep statement. And, uh, and so uh, it turns out that uh, those remaining eigenvalues are exactly the same. So, so in some sense, we expect that in the piadic case, we have uh, layers of eigenvalues. So there is a kind of level zero, which is uh, basically uh, this logarithmic tails, and then level one, which is, uh, uh, this Greenfield story, and then will be level two and so on, which I don't know yet what they look like, but somehow that's what we expect. Okay, and so, uh, so should, uh, there is a, a story with more points, but maybe it's too late to start a new story. So maybe I should stop and uh, see if there are any questions. All right, questions. Um, can you tell me a little more about the analogy you made with the Becca Anzots? Yeah, so uh, this will be more apparent when we do uh, this uh, higher uh, rank case, but uh, uh, the story is the phone. So this Hitchin, quantum Hitchin system in genus zero, it is the uh, Godin uh, system, QSL2. This, uh, this is just Godin system. Uh, and, uh, but it's a Godin system. So, so the point is the phone. So, you have P1 with parabolic points. Let's say you have N parabolic points. Now at each of these parabolic points, you have to fix a twisting parameter, as I said before. We fix those parameters to be uh, uh, basically something like minus one half, but you can uh, uh, make them arbitrary uh, complex numbers, in particular integers. 
And uh, then uh, uh, this corresponds to the following thing. So uh, uh, you put at all those points uh, representations of your uh, uh, Lie group, let's say uh, PGL2 uh, R uh, or PGL2 C uh, corresponding to this twisting parameter. So that's a Casimir value. And then uh, you take the tensor product and you take the invariance in the tensor product and you look at the action of the Gauden operators on this tensor product. So in our setting, these representations are infinite dimensional. They are principal series representations where sl 2 r let's say. And uh, so those uh, look like functions of one variable. And then you tensor a certain number of them and take the invariance. And that's really, can be identified with L2 of this modular space. And then these Gauden operators are the quantum Hitchin operators, which I actually self-adjoined or self essentially self-adjoined or essentially normal. And there is a good spectral. But um, if you uh, vary your parameters from minus one half, uh, it's, uh, let's say your parameter is real you, you can take minus one half plus I S for any real S and that's no problem. But then if you want to vary the real part, so minus one half, then when you hit zero or minus one, the things start break, breaking down. So your analysis will break down, but the algebra will survive. So the representation still exists. And in fact, uh, for integer parameters, they have finite dimensional sub representations. And so you can take a tensor product of those finite dimensional sub-representations of SL2 and take the Gauden operators on them. And, and, and that will be just uh, matrices. And that's exactly the classical problem about statistical mechanics. So in fact, if the most classical one is taking two dimensional representations and taking a tensor product. And then you look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this uh, Gauden uh, operators uh, in this finite dimensional space. And that's what's done by, by Beth Anzat. So, uh, so in that sense, I said that uh, that was analogous, but, uh, uh, and then uh, this authors with real monotony for those, for that problem will correspond to authors with trivial monotony around the parabolic points. And that's worked out in old papers, starting for, with, uh, I guess, Fagan, Frank, and Tichin in 1994 and then some other. Yeah, Thank does you. it answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, if uh, there's no questions, then we should thank Pasha for his amazingly pedagogical exposition. And we will be looking forward to the second installment of that uh, in a week from now. So thank you so much. And we can all clap you, clap, uh, I don't know, what's the word, like that or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in a week. Okay. okay.